My name is Davey Smith. I'm the Chief of Infectious Diseases from Glo and Global Public Health here at UC San Diego. And today I'm gonna to talk about how you get out of a pandemic. And I think the answer to that question is science. So in pandemic survival, there's a few tools that we have. One is testing, that's how you know where the pathogen is. And there's also treatments, and that's to help people who have the infection already. And then vaccines are how to protect ones who are already at risk. Right now we have testing, not enough of it, but at least we know how to do it. Treatments hopefully will be coming soon, probably in the next few months as randomized controlled trials are getting underway and finished. And then vaccines are starting to be developed, but it's still gonna be a while till that happens. So how is UC San Diego moving basic discoveries from bench to bedside? Well, we have some translational research partners. The NIH has been our long steady partner, but right now they just haven't been able to give us the funds quickly enough to help tackle this epidemic. Gates Foundation and other foundations have stepped up a little bit. Industry is all about getting their drugs or vaccines into market and to help them along the way to help with this epidemic is also good. Uh, same thing, but with philanthropy, it's really helped us a lot and help get uh, the science underway um, much better. One of these is the 3D printed swabs. We ran out of swabs early to be able to do testing and we relied on our engineering partners and they were able to give us 3D printed swabs and there I am with a 3D printed in 95 mask. So we ran out of masks, so we asked for 3D printed ones and they came to the rescue. So diagnostics is another big one. If we're gonna flatten the curve, we need more testing. And this is me actually at the beginning of the epidemic testing out one of our uh, lab platforms um, for testing. Without testing, we're blind to when and where and to how to implement prevention measures and to flatten that curve. Since the beginning, we have not had enough testing. Uh, and what we had was just not validated. So there were lots of false positives and lots of false negatives, and we really couldn't trust the test. We also needed samples to validate these tests, hopefully to be able to flatten this curve. So we actually started a UCSD COVID clinic. It was the first COVID clinic in California and it was the only one and it continues to be the only one in San Diego. It's a telehealth clinic and people who are sick are triaged to the emergency room, but they're all positive, usually doing pretty well at home, but want to talk to an infectious disease doctor. And this is Dr. Ritter down there smiling. She was our UCSD physician of the year in 2018 and she's now leading this clinic. But we're also giving opportunities for these patients to come and provide samples for the validation of those tests. And these are all the tests that we're doing right now. The first of the tests are these PCR tests. We have about 10 different platforms that we're currently in the lab that we uh, validate to look for the actual RNA of the virus. And this is the Fluxer G machine off there to the right. And we can get results back in about an hour with that machine. The other ones that are coming online are called serology machines. And that's the antibody that detects the viral infection. And we have a handful of those that are currently in the works and hopefully um, we can get those to be better. And off to the right, it's a lateral flow test for serologies where we do a pin prick, get a little bit of blood, place it on there, and we can see whether or not someone has antibodies already to the virus. We actually used these platforms for a pretty cool um, project. But basically, we were trying to hope, figure out how to open up labs sooner and quicker and safer, and especially also clinics because patients, some patients still need to come into the clinic. Let's say they're a cancer patient or an HIV patient. They need to see their doctor or get their chemotherapy. How can we protect them when they come into clinic? Well, we don't have enough tests to run on everybody. So now we use pooling testing. And basically here is where we took all the people who were working in a COVID lab and every day we did a nasal swab. And then we put that nasal swab in viral transport media. And then we combined five of these tests all into one. That's called a mini pool. And then we did a test on that one mini pool. If it was negative, we were reasonably assured that everybody in the mini pool was negative. If it was positive, we would go back and check and see which one of the people in the pool who were positive. And we did this for a while and we found one of our lab techs who came back positive. And then we tested everybody else. We, they went home um, and they were okay and they went home, but then we tested all the rest of the lab techs and they also turned out to be okay. But by doing, the serial testing, we were able to prevent infection that happened in the lab. And it might be a way forward for these clinics and other labs, maybe even schools to open back up. The next thing we need is treatments. And to do treatments, we really need very high, safe uh, laboratory measure, uh, procedures. And this is what we call biosafety level three. And we have one of those labs now at UCSD. And this at the bottom is Carol Ignacio. She's my senior lab technician and she runs 
our biosafety level three, and this is her <laughs> trying on all her gear, getting ready to restart our BSL-3 for COBE-2 research. So the first thing we did is repurpose old treatments. So how do we actually stop the virus? The first treatment that was there that was used for SARS-CoV-1 and for Ebola and for MERS was called remdesivir. You might've heard about it in the news. And we were one of the first sites to try it out. It, that trial stopped on Sunday and they haven't yet released of the results, but we were one of the first groups to be able to bring that trial to patients. And the next one is hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Those trials, both inpatient and outpatient, are gonna be sponsored by the NIH. We are prime sites for both of those. And in fact, we lead the outpatient trial for that. We're also doing that as an adaptive trial design so that uh, once we figure out if those drugs work or if they don't, then we go on to the next drug that might work. So it's keeping that infrastructure in place and UC San Diego actually leading the way to get the tests, um, to get the trials that we need to get those drugs to market and to patients who can use them. The next one is Ramipril. So this is just an example of how we're partnering with Pfizer to use one of their ACE inhibitor drugs to try that in patients as well. Another one that's very interesting is that sometimes people who uh, have had the infection, they develop enough antibodies that can protect from another infection. If you transfuse that blood into that person, you can help them and that's called convalescent sera. And we're working on trying to get that into our patients if possible. The other thing about this disease is it's not just the infection. The infection causes some, in some people for the uh, immune system to go haywire. And what I mean by that is it causes lots and lots of inflammation. And that's where you get the pneumonia and so bad that sometimes people need to go on ventilator. That's actually not about the infection itself, but the immune response to that infection. So there are some drugs that we've been using in cancer therapies for a while, like tocilizumab and others that can prevent perhaps that inflammation inflammatory response. And we're testing those drugs like tocilizumab now, and we're working with other companies who have similar drugs to perhaps help patients in that way. And then we're also making new treatments by screening old drugs to see if we can make them better. And we've partnered with Scripps Research Institution for screening large drug libraries. And we've already identified 12 new drugs, and we're working on trials to try to figure out how to test them. These are all antiviral drugs. And other UCSD professors like Dr. Shirash and Dr. Varner have developed drugs along the way for years, and we're now testing those to see if they can also help um, prevent COBE infection. But we're also making new ones. We have new lung models to test new drugs. And one thing that I wanted to point out is the little cartoon here is about monoclonal antibodies. And this is where someone gets infected with coronavirus and they make an immune response and one of those antibodies really works against coronavirus. And then we can pluck that antibody out and make lots and lots of it. And then we can use it as what we call a monoclonal antibody to give it as a drug to prevent somebody else from getting infected or after they become infected to actually treat them. And that's very exciting. And we've been working on that quite heavily. The next big step is we need a vaccine. That is the gold standard. That's what's really gonna get us out of the pandemic. But it's gonna take us a while but we've been working with two companies. One is a San Diego company called Inovio, and they d deliver DNA and basically in a shot of CoV-2 protein. So the DNA goes into the muscle and it makes the co coronavirus proteins that then the immune response happens to make an antibody that hopefully protects them from being infected. Uh, we're gonna be a site for the second phase of their testing of their vaccine. They already did the first phase. So we're pretty excited to be involved with that. The next company is called Synvivo, and they are, have their FDA in progress, and we're gonna be the only US site, and that probably starts at the middle of May, so soon. And it's a funny, a very interesting, very cool idea, but basically they take a uh, bacteria here, and in the bacteria, they have this little thing called a plasmid construct, and that plasmid makes coronavirus protein. So, people drink the bacteria, it goes and lives in the gut. It's a common bacteria that lives in the gut anyway. But then when it starts making this protein, the immune response goes to that protein and to makes the antibodies that hopefully can protect somebody from coronavirus later on. So we'll see if it works. These are very exciting things. Um, hopefully we can help develop and bring those to market. But the big thing is future directions. How do we survive a pandemic? We need to know that they're coming. And I was a Boy Scout, so the motto of being a Boy Scout was to be prepared. And it's not like we didn't know this was coming. This, this is the timeline of all the viral infections and pandemics that have occurred in my lifetime. 
So HIV, SARS-1, swine flu, avian flu, MERS, Ebola. We've heard about them all along the way, so we shouldn't have really been surprised when SARS-CoV-2 happened. So how do we prevent from that happening in the future? Or what can we do about it? Well, first, we have to do surveillance. Like right now, we already know that there are hundreds of coronaviruses living in bats right now just ready to jump over to humans. But we don't know how to test for them, so that would be something that we could actively do now. We could also screen drugs for them, we could develop drugs for them, we could make vaccines for them. So that would be in the pandemic response to be proactive versus reactive that we're doing. And then we wouldn't have to have my brother, who is here in his PPE, come out from Tennessee to volunteer at Miramar. It was good to see him, but it'd be better to be prepared and not have to have this disaster management actually happen. So thank you for your attention.